up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. And Gallup always, well, I shouldn't say always, often had a guy named Bob Linsenman as a, as a guest. And Linsenman was also a Michigan guy. And they, you know, they wrote the streamer book together. So it was kind of cool, come full circle again on the river, being both of those guys, or especially Linsenman being the, an, an Asable guy. And Kelly, you know, guiding on the Asable. I got to, you know, put both of those guys in the movie and got to spend some time with them. That was Robert Thompson dropping some great lakes, fly fishing history, gallop, musky country, and spay days today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you for stopping by the show. If you're new to the show and haven't yet clicked that subscribe button, that's a great way to follow the show and ensure that the next episode gets dropped into your inbox. Go ahead, click that subscribe button before we get started. Bear Vault has the perfect solution to keep your provisions secure while heading into the backcountry this year. Bear Vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister to keep bears and other wild animals away from your food. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash bearvault to check out this must-have solution right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash bearvault, B-E-A-R-V-A-U-L-T. This episode is also brought to you by Rare Gear, who's making truly unique and innovative fishing gear to help you travel lighter, faster, and fish more often. This is definitely a super unique product. You're going to have to check it out for yourself. You're going to go to raregear.com right now. That's R-E-Y-R-G-E-A-R, raregear.com. Check it out right now. Robert Thompson is here to take us on a wild ride producing great fly fishing movies. We discover how he found himself producing a number of full-length fishing movies focused on conservation, Uh, warm water, uh, cold water, all sorts of different species. We even dig into a few audio tips in this one, talk about some of the gear he uses, and and we find out why he's faded a bit on the scene in some of the movie uh, production stuff he was doing. There's definitely going to be some required movie watching after this one. Grab your favorite snack, and let's sit down with Robert Thompson from thirdyearflyfisher.com. How's it going, Robert? I'm doing well, Dave. Thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, thanks for uh, putting a little time together to dig into some on some fly fishing movies. Uh, recently, I connected to uh, a couple of people that mentioned some of the stuff you have going, and you've got movies that have been in F3T and some other uh, cool movies. I've watched a few of them recently, so we're going to dig into that. Uh, the Spay Haze and some of the, uh, sorry, Spay yep. Days, right? Is it Spay Days or Spay Haze? It's spay days, and then there's uh, there's a warm water uh, bass pike, pike muskie called summer haze. <laughs> exactly, summer haze. Yeah, so I'm confusing myself. Haze of days, I love it. So uh, so those are a couple, and you got some other stuff, including um, some, I mean, you've got a music uh, background or at least uh, interest too. So we're going to dig into all that. Before we get there, take us back quickly just to how you first got into fly fishing, and then we'll get into movies. Um. Fly fishing for me, you know, like a lot of people, um, I, I grew up fishing and I was a gear guy and, and, a, and a bait guy. And I was kind of around it. My grandfather uh, was a fly fisherman and my dad dabbled with it. So as a kid, there was fly rods and creels and, and little fly boxes laying around. But it wasn't until later, you know, when I, I left for college, you know, I graduated from college and took off and, and, and traveled and, and lived and started a career and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I came back to the Midwest, um, probably, I think it was 99 when I ended up moving uh, to Chicago. And oddly enough, the first three jobs I had in Chicago were all on Ontario Street, which is right off the what they call the Magnificent Mile, Michigan Avenue. And oddly enough, right, basically on the corner of Michigan and Ontario, there's an Orvis store. So I had to go buy it twice a day. And I was starting to get back into fishing, but not fly fishing. But every day when I'd walk by that Orvis store, I'd stop it, you know, because it was right in a corner where I had to cross. So I'd stop and turn around and look at it. And one day I was going to lunch. And this was a true story. One day I was going to lunch and there, there was like a little Asian place across the street from it. 
and I was standing in the corner and I'm looking over my shoulder I'm looking at the Orvis. I'm looking at the, at the lunch spot. And I turned around and I, and I walked into the, to the Orvis store. Cause I could see like the waiters in the fishing department all the way in the back. And a guy came up and asked me if he could help me. And I said, you absolutely can. And, uh, I ended up walking out a couple hours later with everything. Rods, real waiters, flies of, of like a how to video. <laughs> and as I'm walking back to work with these like three bags of, you know, three Orvis bags on my fingers, I walked by an old company that I used to work for. And there was a guy sitting out having a cigarette who, who I worked with and knew very well. And he said, What do you got there? And, and I said, Well, it looks like I'm a fly fisherman now. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute, you fly fish. Cause his office was all always had tying stuff and, and pictures of musky and some trout. And suddenly wow. he goes, yeah, I just got back from Montana. And he's like, what are you gonna do with all that stuff? And I said, probably go to Michigan. And he said, you ever been to the driftless in Wisconsin? I had no idea what that was. I'm like, no. And he said, well, let me take you to the driftless this weekend. So I had two and a half weeks to figure out how to cast a fly rod. And uh, he took me to the driftless. Cool. And uh, that's kind of, that's how it all started amazing and, you know the first fly rod i got because i when i was in the in the orvis store i said i'm gonna fish a little brook trout creek that i fish that i've been fishing it since i was a kid so they, they set me up with a six and a half foot four way and as it turns out probably not the best fly rod to learn on you know those short rods are kind of hard to cast yep and that's that's kind of what i learned on and you know fast forward i, st- I think i got it like on a wednesday and we were going to go fishing on Saturday and I didn't have the faintest idea what I was doing. I was not very good at it. And, but that Saturday that we went to the driftless, I caught one fish towards the end of the day. It was like a little nine inch and you, you would have figured it was 24 inches and I was hooked <laughs> and come to find out and on our way back. I'm like, dude, I would do this again next week in a heartbeat. And he said, he said, I'd love to do it again next week, but unfortunately the season closes. Oh. So he took me, it was, it was the last weekend of the season, the inland season in Wisconsin. So, it, you know, it was kind of like the carrot was mingled and then it was pulled away from me. Yeah. But that's kind of how it all, that's how it all started. And then it just kind of went on from there. That's amazing. Yeah. It reminds me of a story back in, uh, we had April Volke on quite a few, you know, years ago, really. And she talk, said the same story, how she got into steelhead fishing and, uh, or, or I guess it was salmon fishing. And, uh, her first, same thing, first time salmon fishing. And then the season ended and she's like, oh my God, this, what am I going to do? I love this. And then her mentor said, you know what? There's this thing, these uh, species called steelhead. You might, we, you know, so you can fish all year long. And it was just like epiphany, right? Like this moment, like, oh my God. And, and now you, right. You've fished for, you've got these movies with multiple species, including muskie and some others. So you've expanded obviously out from, from, uh, from brook trout and things like that. Yeah. Where, how did that move from from your first nine inch fish into now you're you're doing everything? Well, it was strange because like when I did musky country, I'd never even seen a musky, right? And the way that kind of came about was because if if I get into something and and it becomes somewhat of a passion, I get obsessive about it. So when I started fly fishing. I really got into it. So I was leaving no stone unturned. So whatever, whatever I could find to help me, whether it was videos or fi- trying to find content on television or magazines, any kind of how to thing, I was all over. It. And which, which also led me to an, and again, this is back in early two thousands, um, led me to, you know, message boards, at the time, you know, those online like fishing message boards. And there was one in Wisconsin that I would lurk on because I didn't have anything to offer. So I just sat back every day and just perused it and, and <laughs> you know, read the conversations and tried to pick up little tidbits. But there was a dude on there who was always posting uh, and he had the handle of Afton Angler. And he was a steelhead guy and really big into to swing in for steelhead. But then at some point there was, and, and anyways, well, with him, the, his stories and his writing, you know, were always kind of fascinating to me. And I didn't know this guy, I didn't know him from Boo, but I thought, you know, even in the early days, I thought if this, this guy's got to be as close to a fish bum as you're going to find. And I just visualized this dude living up in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin in a cabin. And that's all he did was fish. Well, at some point he pivoted and went all in on muskie. And then all his stories 
change from steelhead to musky. And turns out the guy's name was Brad Bowen, and and he is the, the you know kind of the main character in uh, in musky country. So when I and, and I just thought it was interesting enough in, in me that I that I actually you know I do work in television, um, and you know I had, had bought a bunch of like how to videos and this and that, and, and as I was looking at that content and you know trying to find any content I could find, uh, in the back of my head I was thinking God I think I could do this kind of stuff and. and maybe do it at the very least just as good as anything I've seen. So kind of that's how the seed got planted. And then, you know, it's a whole nother long story, how I got introduced to Brad and that's kind of how, you know, the musky thing. And then, then the interesting thing was, you know, musky country did pretty well. I would get all these, these, these emails and stuff, people asking me questions about musky fishing. You know, and little did they know, I know nothing about this. So, you you know, you're barking up the wrong tree, but I got a ton (laughs) of emails about where they should go and how they should approach this. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea. And the the same, it's kind of the same thing with spay days. I had never picked up a spay rod, but there was something, you know, interesting about that. And when, when uh, I got to know Rick Kustich and when he approached me about it, um, you know, I, I did a whole movie on swinging up steelhead and I've never swung up a steelhead. There you go. So. You know, part of that is, you know, me kind of wanting to learn too. So you just kind of, you just kind of jump in and, and just do it. So, yeah. you know, between musky and steelhead, I couldn't pick two harder fish to catch, you know? Right. I, I, I do myself a favor and do a bluegill. <laughs> exactly. You pick the fish of a, uh, of a thousand casts and the fish of 10,000 yeah. casts, right? Yeah. So it's, 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 I'm certain, I'm a, certainly a glutton for punishment. So. Yeah. I love it. I, I think that's a that's a cool story. So, so you jump into and just so people know, I mean, you have a background in uh, production, yeah. right? We're not going to dig into that today, but you know, you know how to make a movie, and and so that's your expertise. And obviously, you fly fish as well. Um, and I've watched uh, both of those movies, and definitely they're. You know, they're great. They're hard to, um, I mean, I know how hard it is to make video, right? Just like YouTube, it, all this yeah. stuff, it's not easy. So what has been, you know, describe the movie, say, let's just start with the, the Spay Days. Um, what is that movie about? If you, if you just get a quick little kind of uh, thesis of it. Spay Days is probably the biggest effort that I've made. And like when, when Rick approached me about doing it, we met at a, at a fly show in, in Michigan. And obviously he's, you know, big into musky as well. And he found out I was the guy who did uh, musky country. So he starts kind of like pitching me this idea that, you know, I've always wanted to do a Great Lakes steelhead piece. And the, and the funny thing is we're sitting at a table and he's, you know, kind of making me a pitch about wanting to do something with Great Lakes steelhead. I'm nodding and smiling. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's, I have just like zero interest in doing this, Right. Um, because I just didn't want to do a, a movie about, you know, a, a band of dudes roaming through Steelhead Alley, swinging up Steelhead. But as I got to thinking about it more, I thought, OK, what if we did a Steelhead, Great Lakes Steelhead piece, but we fished tributaries of all five of the Great Lakes? And it kind of more tells the, the story, even though the story has been told numerous times but not necessarily in the steelhead movie about the, the issues with the great lakes. And it particularly kind of hit home with me growing up in a, a small town in Northeast Michigan on Lake Huron. It really had a struggle when the invasives came in and, and it basically shut down Lake Huron. I mean, it was, it was a dead lake for a number of years and the fishery collapsed. So that kind of hit home to me. Um, Because I saw what it did to, you know, it, I mean, it didn't kill my hometown, but, it, you know, th- at one point, I think um, there was like upwards of 100 different charter services on the Lake Huron side. And within two years, I think they were down to like three. Jeez. So it it decimated it. So when I came back to Rick and said, OK, what if we, you know, kind of had a had a bigger vision for this, not just about a bunch of dudes trying to swing up steelhead and he was all for it. But I said, you know, I want to talk to USGA people. I want to talk to, you know, fish and wildlife people. I want to talk about, you know, to, to fisheries biologists, whether it's DNR or university, university professors. And I kind of want to go a little more in, 
in depth into this because the one thing that I don't do um, is, you know, I generally don't don't make twelve minute shorts. Right. Um, unfortunately, I've kind of taken it way the other other way with the last two or three things I've done have been like in hours, you know, not minutes. Like seven hours, right? Eight hours. Yeah. There's there's a lot of content in in summer haze and spay days and even the, the latest musky lessons, uh, musky country lessons. So I've kind of gone maybe a little overboard and they're probably a little longer than they need to be. But I, because you, you'd mentioned I do work in the business in, in the business that I work in, I generally work in 30 seconds. So it's a nice little outlet for me to be able to do these kind of documentaries where I can make them as long as I want. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but, um, so anyways, I know, I know I'm rambling, but yeah, no, it's good. Spay days ended up being, a, a, I like to think a fairly in-depth piece on not only the, the Great Lakes steelhead fishery, but also the issues, um, that have come up with due to invasives. And it traces the story from, you know, the opening of the Welland Canal, which bypassed, uh, Niagara Falls and uh, allowed invasives. And then it kind of goes through each one of the invasives that came in because it was a big whole snowballing effect um, that, you know, the Great Lakes back in the day, that you know, the top predator was the lake trout. So the lake trout kept everything in check. But then as the, you know, the sea lamprey got in, the sea lamprey took out the lake trout. So now there's no top predator. At the same time, the alewives got in. They went crazy. And at some point, I can't remember exactly what the year was, 80%, I think it was like 80 to 85% of the biomass in the Great Lakes was alewives. Wow. That's how bad they were. And they would have like yearly fish die-offs that were killing the tourism industry because the tons and tons and tons of dead alewives would wash up on the beach. Jeez. And it was a disaster. And that's when they had to come up with a plan to deal with these invasives and especially the alewives at the time. So that's when they introduced uh, the Pacific salmon by a guy named Howard Tanner. And he basically created a billion dollar sports fishing industry, you know, and, and it, kind of, and it kind of went on from there. And, and it's just kind of a weird thing now, you know, when, when it started to collapse, now you have this, you know, billion dollar sports fishing industry hanging in the balance, but it's hanging in the balance off essentially two invasives, you know? So then it became a question of, you know, there was a lot of people that, that didn't want the invasives in, and, but now it's like, well, now we need to save these invasives because another invasives is is running roughshod so it's it's kind of a weird dynamic now that you know yeah that, that you have one camp that wants to be all natural and native but then you have a whole nother camp that we need these invasives because there's a lot of money involved yeah and you need the invasives because you're saying that the invasives are, are uh, well remind me of that because you did a little history lesson there from going back a ways um, but take us to that, the, the, the collapse, what, what years were you talking about there with, with the, the collapse of the, the fishery? And I should have done my homework and it was, it was in, I think the early two thousands, like Lake Huron and what, what happened is, and I, hopefully I get all this right. And, and I did the movie about it, but I, I didn't really go back. Oh yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, so what happened, it, it was kind of a, you know, a perfect storm at least as far as Lake Huron was concerned, is the, the DNR didn't really realize that when they planted the salmon that they would reproduce, right? So in order to deal with the alewives, they started planting Pacific salmon. And it worked unbelievably because there was so much food base out there. The, the salmon were coming back and they were huge, 20, 25-pound salmon. Yeah. And Robert, you're talking about planting salmon. I mean, they, they, they started doing this in like the early part of the 1900s, right? Yes. Yes. I think in like in the 60s, mid 60s, early 60s. And again, I could be somewhat off on those dates. And, and that's when they, they first did the plantings, right? And then within a year or two, the, the returns, because they, they don't throw them right in the lake. They put them in tributaries. Yeah. So those fish have to smolt and then they eventually go out to the lake. And I remember uh, Howard Tanner, who was the fisheries director, um, who, who was the one responsible for, for coming up with this idea, had the people from the West coast come back just, you know, so they could kind of gauge where things were at. And 
the fisheries people from the West Coast saw how big the smolts were. And they basically said, you have no idea what's about to happen. Hmm. Just a, and it just exploded with the, the number of fish and the size of the fish and how quickly this fishery formed. But what the DRNR didn't know is those salmon were actually reproducing. So I think the DNR were, were you know, I, I think it was like planting like a million uh, salmon, right? But they were also reproducing by the millions and they didn't know that. So suddenly the, the salmon are wiping out everything. Because they don't know the DNA, oh. know just how many salmon are actually in the Great Lakes, and huh. they completely demolish the alewives. And at the same time, because they're running out of alewives, they start and, and the and the salmon are predisposed to eat, you know, things that look like, you know, about the size of an alewife, you know, a sardine. Yeah, and they start taking out everything. So there was a brown trout. They 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 basically took out everything just to try to survive. And then the charters are running, you know, running trips and they're noticing they're not catching nearly as many fish. And, and the fish that are catching are scrawny and, and deformed. And, you know, they look like they're, you know, fish are starving, which is what was happening. Oh, wow. And within like or two, there's no salmon. There's no salmon. There's no alewives. There's no lake trout. There's no walleye. Damn. It basically, there was some that were considering Lake here on a dead lake. And then they start, and then the same thing kind of started to happen over in Lake Michigan, where for a while there, um, the DNR, you know, halted planting, plantings of of salmon just because the alewife population was dwindling. Wow! And what about the at the same time you have another? I mean, the steelhead right has been there for quite a while. Is that? I mean, they were how did the steelhead fit into all this? The steelhead did fine, and and that. Was- was kind of, you know, part of the reason I wanted to do spades was to ask that question. Could the steelhead populations uh, get affected like the salmon populations did? And the, and the answer to that is, is no, because the steelhead um, are opportunistic eaters. Salmon are kind of predisposed. They want that sardine-ish type fish. And, and steelhead will eat anything. So they'll eat bugs. They'll eat whatever. Yeah. So the steelhead population was fine, you know, only because they're opportunistic feeders. Now, you know, since then, Lake Huron has come back. The interesting thing is the walleye population has exploded. The, the lake trout have come back. And rumor has it the salmon fishing has, has returned in somewhat. So, so it seems like there's a little better balance now. And I, and I think they, they started, uh, the DNR started planting some salmon back in, in, in Lake Michigan as well. So it was a blip, a, a very big blip. Yeah, a very big blip. And that, and that's the thing you don't people don't realize all the time when you see these and that that's a crazy story. And and well, this is a good segue to your movie because we'll we'll put a link in the show notes for people to check out if they want to hear the whole story. This is just a snippet obviously and it's a good uh, a good movie, but yeah, I mean just natural fluctuations in populations, they go up and down, right? I mean these lines it's not like they're going up or down. So there's natural fluctuation and then um and like steelhead's a good example. Like on the West Coast, there's a big decline right now in steelhead, but that's just because of ocean conditions and other factors and humans. But it's going to change and likely turn back up. It's just going to take some time, right? It could take 15 years to get back up to some point. I'd imagine the Great Lakes is the same way. It's not like instantly going to recover right. these things. It sounds like this thing took 15 years or, or something to get back up to where it is now, right? Yeah, yeah. It took a number of years. I don't think it took quite that long, but it took a number of years and and I think the approach w- w- with the DNR is they just kind of left it alone and said it's 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 you know it needs to kind of rebound on its own and and it's you know we're going to see the strongest will survive and we'll see what happens and, and what you know what comes back and and you know I don't really fish the Great Lakes that much but keeping in contact with some of the people that were in the film some of the biologists you know I, I've heard that you know and just and just kind of perusing around reading fishing reports and stuff. That, you know, again, as far as Lake Huron's concerned, um, the lake trout population is great and the, the walleyes are back and, and, and it seems healthy again. Now, will it ever be that, that, that salmon fishery that it was? I don't know. I, you know, I, are there, are there a lot more charter services back in business? I, that I, I have no idea. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was kind of an interesting time and, and, and kind of also one of the angles I took growing up in the hometown that I did, we have, uh, a little town called Alpena, Michigan, 
um, they have the longest running fishing tournament in Michigan. It was called the, you know, the Alpena Brown Trout Festival. But the Brown Trout Festival, um, I'm sorry, the Brown Trout population was dwindling every year and every year and every year. And at the time I shot uh, an interview with the, with the president of the tournament at that time, I think he said the year before they had only caught like two or three brown trout. And he didn't, he was skeptical whether they would catch any the year that I interviewed them, that the, the festival was going on, and they didn't. So, the first year that the fishing festival that was named after a certain fish, you can't catch them anymore. <laughs> wow. So, it kind of just shows the ebb and flows, uh, you know, of the Great Lakes and just how much they've changed. And they've tried stocking and doing all kinds of programs to get the brown trout, at least on the Huron side, back uh, without a lot of success. Yeah. So it's, just, you know, there, there are ebbs and flows. And then, and then also, you know, the, the film also gets into, you know, right after all the, the alewives and stuff, then you start getting the, all the zebras and quagga mussels come in. And they, and the gobies. Yeah. So there's, there's this never ending smorgasbord of invasives who continually, you know, keep. Yeah. And the invasives struggle. You can look at anywhere over the country where invasive species, they're very good. They're very good at surviving. So there's a lot of conservation issues, obviously, you know, and, and I think your movies point to some of these. Is also, if you look at the muskie hunt, uh, country and some of your other movies, are they all, do they all have a kind of a focus a little bit on the conservation piece as at least part of the movie? Yeah, I, I think they do. I, I, I think, you know, you can't help but talk a little bit you know, about the conservation angle on, on some of these, because it's certainly important. But yeah, in, in musky country, you know, there was a little bit of conservation angle. And even in summer haze, you know, it didn't get, you know, really, really in, in depth into it. But it's just more, you know, management issues and how fisheries are managed and, and this and that. But again, I, I don't like to get preachy. So there's that that kind of balance you try to reach, yeah, you know, to keep somewhat entertaining, but yet, you know, kind of try to bury a little message in there, but not, you know, crack people constantly over the, over the head with it. So, yeah, that's right. It's balance. That's right. Yeah. It's kind of a subtle, yeah, you got it. You have a subtle, a subtleness to, obviously we all know it's the most important thing because our fisheries and species, they all depend on, you know, uh, healthy ecosystems, but, um, but it's a struggle because people come in, you know, just like today, right? People are coming in listening to this because they want to hear about whatever, right? Spay, uh, musky. And so I try to balance it as well to try to not uh, focus exclusively on that at every episode, and but just hint on it that people realize, okay, where can we go to make take action? I guess let's just start there, you know, again, since we're at this point. So if somebody wants to learn more, take action, do whatever, if you had, is there the Great Lakes? I mean, are there just a bunch of conservation groups? Where would you point? somebody if they want to take this conversation further on the conservation stuff there's steelhead organizations and salmon organizations but I, I think probably the dnr could you know is a good starting place to to point people uh in the right directions if they wanted to get a hold or get involved in in some of these conservation groups daddy flies established in 1928 is the oldest family run shop in the country and you definitely know I'm all about the history. Uh, today on this episode, we've been digging into a little bit of the history, hearing from folks like uh, Kelly Gallup and other big names that uh, Robert has interviewed along the way. And Deddy Flies has been providing that tradition and history for a long time. They're located in Livingston Manor, and they are the welcoming place on the creek or online. Deddy's Flies inventory consists solely of products that meet every angler's demand for high quality and for great service. Of course, they also offer fly fishing and casting lessons as well as guided trips. For more information, check out Deddy Flies right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash D-E-T-T-E. You can also give them a call right now, 845-439-1166. Wetflyswing.com slash Deddy. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to check out and say hi to Deddy. Okay, perfect. So I want to jump back in, and, and we mentioned a couple of movies, The Musky Hunter, Spay Days. Can you just walk us through some of the other movies um, that you've done and just uh, maybe give us, I'm not sure which one was your first one and which was your last and maybe what you have coming. Yeah, I th I kind of lose track. I, I think I've done 
seven or eight of these things. The first one um, was Night of the Hex, and that was never really meant to see the light of day. Um, <clears throat> the only reason I, I wanted to do that one was just to learn how to make a DVD because back in the back, this is like 2009, 2010. So back then, the, the only way to watch any kind of films uh, was DVD, you know, because it, it was very hard to find any kind of fly fishing program in any way, shape or form, you know, because it's just such a small industry, you know, in terms of broadcast, you know, good luck trying to find find anything back then. So the only way you could really watch anything or see content, fly fishing content was either a DVD or, a, you know, VHS for those of you who remember the, the old tape days. So I didn't know how to go about, you know, how do you do that? You know, how do you get it manufactured? How do you get it distributed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to learn that process. So I did Night of the Hex just to go through that process. And I just assumed that once I figured it all out, I'd make 10, 15 copies of it and give it to the people um, who were involved because I, in the back of my head, I knew I wanted to do musky country. So that's how night of the hex came about. And then musky country followed that one. And then after musky country was, uh, because I started fly fishing in the driftless and I really fell in love with it. I wanted to do a film about the driftless. So that was the third one. Then my big love in life at the time in terms of a fishery was back in Michigan was the Asable river. So I did one on the Asable. And then after that was called the river. Um, but on that one, there was a couple, you know, sub features, I guess. Um, one was called the brothers Brown, which was on the film tour. I don't even know the date, maybe 2013, 2014, something like that. And then the other feature was on a very well-known, uh, in the bamboo world, uh, a guy named Bob Summers. So I did a little short on him called Summers. Then that led into Spade A's, which led into uh, Summer Haze, which led into the latest, which is kind of coming back, I don't want to say full circle, but coming back all the way back around to Muskie. Um, with something that, that I called musky country lessons, which is more, it's kind of more of a techniques, uh, instructional ish kind of wrapped around a movie. Um, I didn't want to do a, a full on instructional. I mean, you know, the thought of doing something like that, I'd, I'd rather jam a fork in my ear, <laughs> but if, yeah. if, if we could, we could kind of make a movie and throw instructional bits into it. You know, I just didn't want to do, you know, uh, Brad Bowen is is kind of back um, as our, you know, chief person in this. And I, I just didn't want to, uh, you know, it gave me cold sweats, you know, it, seeing him say, hey, I'm hey, everyone, I'm Brad Bowen. I've been a musky guy for 20, you know, 20 years in this 10 part series. I'm going to show you. I'm like, no, there's no I, I can't do that. So we kind of came up uh, with a little different way to present it. Um and, and it's doing well. So that one's done well. And because, you know, over the years, if I ever if I if the most criticism, you know, that I that I've read about things that I've done is people complaining that they didn't learn about the rods and the reels and how to fish them and where to fish them, what time of the year. But, you know, at no point in any of my titles did it ever say anything about techniques. <laughs> so I don't know what they were expecting. So. I decided to do this one for, you know, all the, the musky weirdos out there. Um, there's all kinds of, of, of good information that you can glean from it. I hope, um, but probably, probably more suited to the more novice musky guys or gals coming into it than, than the seasoned veterans, but even though maybe they can, they can pick something up out of it. So, yeah. So this one's out there and is it also like seven hours long or what's that look like? <laughs> it it is out there um it's streaming only i think the actual film is like well three about four and a half it's three parts but then there's a lot of extra features there's a lot of extra features um that that i didn't put into the main that 
that make it there's I think there's seven hours, seven ish hours of content. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And then I actually jumped in front of the camera, which I don't like to do um, because I get a lot of questions over the years since I started doing these. I get a lot of questions about, you know, what kind of cameras do I use? And, and you know, within the last few years, because cameras have changed, it's now, you know, you can get camera bodies with interchangeable lenses. Now it's also what kind of lenses do I use? Uh, I've got question, a lot of questions on how do I do my field audio? So I just went and did a pretty in-depth, you know, pertaining mainly to the musky lessons on the equipment that I use, the cameras that I use, the lenses, and, and all the whys and wherefores. Um, so if anybody's, you know, into that kind of thing or wants to geek out on cameras and lenses, there you go. Yeah, that's good. And, and so you've got all of the, uh, you know, that, and that is a good question, right? Because people are probably, you know, here too are listening like, wow, how do you make a movie? I mean, obviously people are doing stuff with iPhones now, but probably not many of the professionals. Uh, is that the gear that you use? Just for a quick snippet on that, um, we can look at the movie to, to get further. What does that look like for you? I mean, you obviously have a, a, a you know experience and that's your kind of your career. Uh, is this something yeah. where you've got a lot, thousands of dollars in gear to produce these movies? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's changed. I mean, you know, because I've worked in this business for, you know, over 20 years. And I didn't start doing the fly fishing films to get into the business. I, I, I was already working in the business. I went to college for it. You know, it's kind of my career. It's how I make a living. And in my career, I do nothing that has anything to do with fishing or anything to do with these, with these fishing films. I'm, I'm completely on the other side of the fence. So to me, these are, these are kind of an outlet. But because I work in the business, I'm, I'm kind of a snot about it to a point that I, I like to use bigger cinema cameras and I, and I get it. There's a the whole DSLR thing going on and it's amazing. It's, you know, the technology and where it, where it's, how much it's changed since I got into the business versus where it is now. And, and I can't bitch about it too much because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. If, if technology hasn't changed the way it has, it's allowed me to get gear. I never thought I'd have, you know, back when I started in this business, you know, a, a standard definition, um, analog camera, broadcast camera, probably on average with the lens was probably around between anywhere from 45 to $60,000. Jeez. So, you know, your, your kid, your average kid isn't going to be sitting in his bedroom slinging a 45 to $60,000 camera. And then they were all tape based. So you needed decks and a whole editing suite was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars you know so now your iphone or your android is a great camera and gopros and and all the dslrs so everything's a lot cheaper but you know now everyone's a filmmaker you know yeah <laughs> who isn't a documentary right. filmmaker these days everyone is. yeah we everybody that's so right I, I just like to use a certain level of camera so i use more cinema ish type bigger cameras i don't really use the dslrs and and I'm, and that's not saying that they they are capable they're probably a majority of the films you see out on film tours and stuff are probably shot with with those kind of cameras um i just don't prefer them i just i just like you know it's the cameras that i grew up on are, are made to make a film or a doc or commercials or whatever um in the dslrs to me um and I'm probably getting myself into hot water the, the deeper I go down this yeah. road. Right. With these, you know, because I don't want to make it sound like I'm trashing them, but I just no. I just like to use a certain type of camera. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing. And you probably have some people that you got know, like your own taste, right, in certain things. But I'm yeah. I'm picturing, you know, this gigantic camera on the shoulder of somebody, right? The the video the movie, you know, that that whole scene. Um but well, I guess first, you know, that there's that. Is that what we're talking about? And then also, what is the difference if you say somebody who's got a nice uh, Canon, you know, whatever the, you know, I don't know what the best Canon DSR mm -hmm. is, but there, you know, there's the a few of them out there. So what is yeah. the difference in the production? Is it do only you see it or do other people see it? I would say from image quality, a lot of the smaller cameras, the mirrorless or DSLRs, whatever you want to call them, you know, image quality, I, I think they're they're about on par 
with with the cameras that I'm shooting with. I, I really can't sit down and and look at something that maybe w- that was shot in a mirrorless or DSLR and say that the stuff that I'm shooting is better from an image perspective. For me, it's more about usability and, and comfort. I just grew up on those bigger cameras. Now, what I'm using isn't like, you know, the, the mental image you get of the news camera guy with the big camera on his shoulder. That's what I grew up using. That's how I started. I'm also not like a shooter by trade. I've just shot enough that, that I know enough to be to be dangerous. Um, so I, I say I have a background in shooting, but I was never like a camera dude. Yeah. But I can I can bluff my way through it. Um, so the cameras I'm using are like we're, the main camera like that I used on Musky Country Lessons is the, the latest camera that Sony came out with. It's called the FX9. And it's more of a it, it looks like a cinema cinema camera something that you would see on a you know shooting spots or episodics or a feature all right so it's much bigger than your mirrorless or dslr and there's and and there's i think there's been a movement over the past few years to get smaller smaller lighter and and i don't necessarily feel that that's better um smaller and lighter can have its own disadvantages it can certainly have its advantages in some situations but i just i don't like the smaller lighter I like a little cam. I like a camera that's got some beef, and also because I do, you know, other outside work, I think there's a perception. And if I show up with on a set with the cameras that I'm using, um, I think there's a perception from the client that they're getting their money's worth. You know, right. if I show up with, with a if, with on a paid job with with a mirrorless or DSLR, you know, there's there might be that perception that well, you know, my nephew's got one of those. <laughs> right. What the hell are we doing hiring this dude? Yeah. You know, so, and, and I think there's some validity to it. There might be some people who will, who will say he's full of shit, but I, I think there is. Yeah. So that's just, that's just me that, and, it, and it's, and it, again, I think it's a generational thing. I'm older. So that's kind of what I started with. You know, the newer generation have, have come into the DSLRs and they're, and they're a lot, they're a lot cheaper for the most part. You know, they're probably half, half of what I spent on stuff. And again, it doesn't make it better. It's just it's just kind of what you like. That's right. So you're set up and just uh I'm just curious on this cost wise, a camera like that, the FX nine is is closer to like ten thousand dollars than it is a thousand. Yes, yes. The body is exactly the body on it, I believe, was eleven thousand. Yeah. Yeah, and then you add the the lenses and everything else. Yeah, and all all your periphery, you know, I mean, realistically, by the time you get done getting the media and batteries and and just the basic stuff that you need, you know, you're you're really probably in that fourteen range, fourteen fifteen. So it's not a cheap thing to get set up in, and and I get why, you know, there's going to be some people who won't go that route because I mean, yeah, you know, that's a big chunk of change. Now, when you get into the real cinema cameras, I mean, you're you're you know, you really can't get into them for anything less than 60. They're, you know, they're going to cost you between 60 and 100. And that's a whole yeah. different level of things. Right. But the, the cameras that I'm using are, are, are mainly geared towards your owner operator. You're kind of one man band. Gotcha. The cinema cameras are, are, op- are really geared towards um, on a film set, they'll, they'll call them a camera department where they'll have multiple people. Um, dealing with the cameras, whether it's the deep, it's a DP and, a, and an AC um, and a camera operator. So they're, they're, you know, the menu systems are, you know, in different areas on the camera, whereas the ones I'm using, the menu systems are, are basically at one place because they're geared for your, your solo guy. Right. Did you talk about when you look at the musky, the new uh, musky country uh, movie you did? Did you dig into a little on production? Because you got that whole side of it too, right? You got the filming, but then you actually have the editing and the production. Is that something you touch on? I didn't get into the whole editing because that could be a whole nother, yeah, a whole nother right. hour I could spend on the software that I like to use, which is not the software. I'll guarantee you, I'm the only one doing fishing content using the software that, that I'm using. I will guarantee oh, really? you that. <laughs> yeah. um, just, just because it's, and again, it, I, I probably, it's probably going to you know come off sounding really snotty, but I use a particular software 
that I've used for 20 years. Um, it's a higher end software. It's like an editing compositing software. That's, it's mainly like, like I live in Chicago, mainly all the top, um, we call them post houses, um, use this software because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of companies in this town are doing national work, spot work features, that kind of stuff, visual effects, high-end visual effects. And this software does all that, but it's just, it's just what I have been using for so long. You know, I used to, you know, I used to cut on Avid, used to cut on Final Cut. I don't use Premiere, which is mostly mainly what people are using is Premiere Final Cut. Um, I'm using a software called Flame. And it's, 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 it's high end and it's expensive. And, and I, I, I don't need it for what I'm doing, but it's just what I use. So that's what I use. It's nice to know I have all the bells and whistles if I need it, but probably, you know, people aren't going to want to spend what this software costs on a yearly basis. No, same thing as as the video. You're at a higher level of production, yeah. uh, and I'm you know, on the the F well the F3T the movie. So you have these full length, and you mentioned in 2014 you had some fly fishing film tour. What was that like? How did you cut that down? Well, for me, when when I was doing the film tour, basically the way I operated was I never did anything for the film tour you know, specifically in length for them. Meaning I didn't say I'm going to do a film tour piece. So I'm going to go out and try to shoot, you know, whatever my subject is and make a 12 to 15 minute piece. I was always, my goal was I am doing a feature on whatever I'm doing. And if I get done with it in time, and if I can cut the full feature, then I will try to hack down a 10 to 12 minute piece. So the years that I was on the film tour, which was probably, I think it was four or five years, probably, geez, I don't know, was it 2010 to 2015, I think, some, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. I think I did five years. But at each one of those, you know, the, the timing had to be right. And that's what kind of made it difficult and kind of why I, you know, I just kind of phased myself out of doing it. It just got to be too much. In that I had to have my shooting schedule kind of in alignment with with their timeline in that, you know, I I had to have my feature done by November-ish, early December. And then after I got that done, then I would sit down and say, all right, how can I call 10 or 12 minutes out of this thing for uh, a tour cut? Because I think I generally they needed that by like end of December. So, you know, it, everything just kind of had to fall in place timing wise. Um, so it was it was it was a lot. You know, it was a, it was a lot to juggle and, and just kind of added stress. Um, when I would tell them that yes, I'll have something for you, and then it was like, okay, great, now I got to have something for them. So, I think that's when it just got to be a little little too much. And then, you know, I th- I think. It was the steelhead one was the first one that wasn't on the tour because I just I just didn't know you know how to cut this thing down. It's so big and so massive, and you know I just I looked at that thing and said I don't know how I how I call this thing down in ten minutes. Yeah. So you know I, I passed on that one, and then since then I just never never kind of revisited it. Um, so it's a different deal for me because I think most people that are on the film tour. Are doing something specifically for them, so they're they're starting out saying, "I got to come up with a you know a twelve minute piece, twelve All to fifteen right. minutes." Where me, I never did that. I was always thinking, "I'm I'm going to make an hour to an hour and a half piece, and then if I have time, I'm going to cut it down uh, for the tour." So it was a it was just it just to me, and it's not. I mean, I think the film tour is awesome, and it's, and, and it's great for the sport. To me, it just became, you know, the ends didn't really justify the means for me. Yeah, uh, that's right. I didn't really feel, I got to the point, I didn't really feel that a title of mine did any better or any worse if it was or wasn't on the tour. Yeah. So that was just kind of the decision I made. And, and I also didn't want to be, you know, just didn't want to have to pile on to think that, you know, I got to come up with something every year for the film tour. Right. I, I, I didn't want to kind of get, into that groove. And again, that's nothing to do. The film tour is great. Love those guys. 
Yeah. Just, you know, I think a lot of people go through, you know, you do your X, X amount of years on it. And then, you know, there's always somebody new wanting to throw their hat in the ring, uh, which is good. So I did my, and then I stepped aside and, and, you know, it's rolled on without me and has done great. So, yeah, that's pretty awesome. And what do you, so now are you still always working on something in the back of your head, the next uh, fly fishing movie? I mean, in, in some aspects, yes. You know, I, I said that the people that know me, I was supposed to be done with this in 2014 when I did the river, when I released the river. That's when I said I was done. And then, of course, I meet Custage, and now, okay, now I'm doing a steelhead. And then Summer Haze came about because years and years and years ago, before I started doing like the, the, the DVDs, I did a little short uh, with a guy that guides up for tight lines. I think you did a, a podcast with Tim Landry, didn't you? Oh, it's Flagler. Yeah, Tim Flagler. Uh, Landwehr. Oh yeah, yeah, Tim Landwehr. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Yep, Tim Landwehr. Yep. Yeah. So I worked. I did a thing with one of his guides, and I didn't know Tim at the time, and it turned out pretty cool. And that he showed Tim, so Tim got on the you know called me and he said, let's talk, and and we started trying to you know figure out some kind of thing with bass. But at the time, I really wasn't into bass fishing, so I was kind of lukewarm to it. And the thing that we had talked about never really came to fruition. But for whatever reason, you know, Tim and I seemed to hit it off and we, we would talk on and off throughout a year, you know, just a, a quick email or a quick phone call about whatever. And he, and he always ended it with, well, you, you know, if you ever want to do anything on smallmouth, let me know. And I'd say, absolutely. And doing, uh, during spay days, I uh, worked with the nether and I think he, he might've done something with him. Uh, Mike Schultz was in spay days Oh yeah, and he always mentioned yeah. Too, same deal. Dude, you ever want to do anything on bass? Let me know. And it was a break between seasons of shooting spay days, which I enjoyed shooting. But, you know, the thing about steelhead is you're always cold. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not in the greatest conditions. And I think I spent like two and a half seasons doing that one. And I think it was a break between, it was the summer between the second and, and final season. And I started to get into bass fishing. And one night I was sitting on an awesome August night in a shorts and t-shirt on the bow of my boat on this great lake. The wind laid down, you know, the, the lake was glass and I was just running poppers for largemouth. Then it was so visual and so cool. That's when I started thinking, man, this would be really cool, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of how I started thinking. And I'm, I'm barefoot and I'm warm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be shooting this, you know, in warm weather, not getting hit in the face with sleet and snow and rain and, and be freezing. Um, so that's kind of how summer haze came about. And I, you know, I called Tim thereafter and called Mike and said, all right, I, I think I'm ready to do something. Um, but I gotta, I gotta finish spay days. But as soon as I finish that, let's, let's jump into this other thing. So yeah. it, it pretty much since I, if I look back, I, I think the first one came out in 2009, 2010, I've been in constant motion for what, 11 or 12 years. There's never really been a break. Yeah. So you have a break now. Yeah. So, so kind of now that I put out, uh, lessons in very end of this past year, end of 21, I'm kind of in a, in a, in a break now. And I said lessons was going to be the last one. I said summer haze was going to be the last one. And then I decided to, you know, you're like, <laughs> you know, you're like Robert, you're like the Michael Jordan. Remember when he was retiring from basketball, but he just couldn't do it. You're kind of like the same thing, right? Is this, you're going to keep out there. We want to see more of your stuff. And, and I think part of it also summer haze did really well. And because of that, I, I was thinking about not, not just because of the fishing thing, just because of the other side stuff that I do. I was thinking about up in, up in my camera game. So that's when um, I decided to, to buy the FX9. And then, of course, when I buy that, I'm thinking, well, you know, a, a great way, if I've learned anything, a great way to break in a camera is to, to do a fishing film. Because you, you, you put that camera through so much. I mean, you basically throw a camera through, you know, every piece of weather you can. You know, so you can really test out a camera and see and see, you know, in terms of build quality, 
because you're going to throw everything. It's going to be, you know, hot and cold and rain and wind and sleet and snow and dust, water, et cetera, et cetera. So you really push a camera when, when you do one of these things. So I was thinking, well, I have this new camera, you know, might as well do another one. So that's, that's when, you know, how lessons, you know, truthfully, that's how lessons was because I had yeah. this camera and Brad and I had, had mentioned it. But again, I was, I was real lukewarm on doing like a, just a straight up instructional. But once I pitched the idea of doing it a little differently, um, then I was all on board and, and, you know, for two hardcore seasons, you know, really push that camera and, you know, kind of put it, put it through its paces. So, yeah, so now, now I'm in a break and I said I was done, but, you know, you give me some time and I start thinking about things and I kind of have an idea. Yeah, you'll be back. Head you'll be back, right? <laughs> to do another one, but this one would be much easier and it's only a certain time of year. And this one would truly, and I don't want to say, because I haven't really talked to anyone about it. Um, I've just been rolling around it in my melon. Um, but this one would really take it full circle to where it all started. Uh, and it would be a much easier piece because it's, you know, a certain event that happens in a certain time of year. So it wouldn't be like steelhead or the warm water thing where when you're, you know, you're actively shooting anywhere from six to nine months a year. And that was, you know, and that's the grind of say a, a spade days because the, you know, the steelhead season can be fairly long. You know, if you, if you start spring and go right through the fall and winter to the following spring, you know, you, you're really, your your only off time is really like, May, June, July, August, you know, maybe September, but you know, October through April, you can actively pursue it. And it's, and it's kind of the same way with, with the warm water deal. If you include musky, you can start in April and go through November or December if you really wanted to. So those are long piece, you know, you're, you're invested. I mean, you're committed. If you really want to try to capture it all, it's commitment. And then, you know, once you're into it, it's, I always like when I start them or I come up with the idea and then generally within a month or two, I think, what am I doing this for again? Especially musky, you know, because yeah. it's, it's such a losing proposition. With over 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you're doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness as well. I just recently cracked into a new bag of, uh, of anglers from part of the Artisan series. And, uh, and this was Derek DeYoung, who's got a cool artist series they got going on. The brook trout was the last bag that I clicked into and uh, and cracked it open, ground that stuff up, and threw it in the coffee maker, did a little drip coffee, and, and it was delicious. This artist series sends $1 for each sale to Casting for Recovery, another great group we plan on getting on the show as well very soon. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species we know and love. You can visit wetflyswing.com slash anglers. That's A-N-G-L-E-R-S to grab a bag of freshness today. You support this podcast by checking out Anglers online right now. I wanted to highlight before we move off to this, uh, Mike Schultz was episode 229. Uh, Tim Landwehr was 273. Both were amazing. And uh, and I'll put those in the show notes. Summer, you mentioned, you know, obviously, yeah, steelhead can be kind of cold and that is a challenge for some people. Uh, I wanted to, you know, I, w- I didn't want to leave this because we're talking movies, obviously, here today. We're talking fly fishing movies. But um, talk about the um, some of your mentors. Are you, have you had have you had a mentor in the um, in the video production space? I have not had a mentor in the in the video production space. Um, and I throw that out there, Robert. I, I throw that out there because I just as you're talking one of the movies that comes up has come up so many times, you know what I mean? Because it was back in the early nineties and I can't remember, was it, were you around, were you fishing? Do you remember the river runs through it piece? Yes. Oh yeah. That area. So you remember that, right? It came out, it was the biggest thing in fly fishing as far as getting new people in. And, and Robert Redford was this, yep. I mean, obviously it's Robert Redford. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so what do you, when you think of, let's just start there. river runs through it. You think of that movie. What is, what impact has that had on, on your, um, 
you know, what you do with movies. You know, a river runs through it. I mean, I loved it just as a film before I was in, into fly fishing. Okay. There you go. Cause I was a, a big rep Robert Redford fan, mm. you know, in terms of not only as an actor, but as a director. Um, but I, I will say this now that you mention that here's in terms of a, a, I don't want to say he was a mentor, but, or even really an influence. But when I first got into fly fishing and I, and I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I'll, I'll go to any lengths and I'll uncover whatever I need to do, turn over whatever rock I need to do to get better at this. Um, there wasn't a lot of videos out there. But what I did end up picking up because I knew I was going to fish this little tiny brook trout creek um, up near my hometown is I got um, Joe Humphrey's, I think it was called Small Stream Tactics. And that was like my Bible, right? And I, I don't know how many times I watched that thing. Probably 50. I would spend the winters and, it was, and I got it on VHS tape. And I would just throw that thing in the VCR and I just watched it and watched it. And then I ended up getting his nymphing uh, video. And then he also did one, I think, called The Night Game about night fishing. So when I was first starting out, like within the first year or two, it was all Joe Humphrey stuff, right? So it was kind of cool to come full circle at a Michigan show a number of years ago. Uh, the fly fishing show, they have what they call the author's booth, even though I'm not an author, but it, you know, they would throw in one who's written a book or made a movie or whatever. They would throw you in this booth at the show and, you know, people could come up and chat with you and buy a DVD or buy a book or whatever. So I got put in the booth with Joe. Oh, cool. And it was just, it was so cool for me anyways. And he was the nicest guy. Yeah. And we got to sit and chat and I, and I told him. I said, you know, when I first started out doing these things, you know, your, your small stream tactics was, was like my Bible and he just loved it. And he just, Oh, the, the camera guy. And, and you know, of course I don't know the guy's name, but he whipped the guy's name off. Oh my God. He had this old Ikigami camera and he had that three <laughs> strapped over his shoulder. I flat wore that guy out. He's trying to walk with me, but you know, fishing these little tiny, yeah. and, Oh God, we had a time and the batteries that he had to carry. And it was just great, you know, <laughs> sitting there just chatting with Joe Humphreys, you know, after I'd watched all his, you know, all those movies, all the things that he did for all those years. So, you know, I, I again, I don't want, I don't know if it's an influence or, a, a, yeah. you know, but it, that's, cool. that's what I watched, you know, and it's, it's been kind of cool. The other thing, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was a, there was a show on TV, one of the, one of the only ones that you could, it was, uh, Fly Fishing TV, I think it was called. Fly Fishing yep. TV. Oh, yeah. And they had kind of like a revolving host. And it would be like Jack and Kelly Gallup uh, was the host. And at the time, I didn't know he was, a, you know, again, I was new to it. I didn't know he was a Michigan guy. So, you know, my upbringing in the early days of fly fishing was like Joe Humphreys, Jack Dennis, Kelly Gallup. And Gallup always, well, I shouldn't say always, often had a guy named Bob Lindzenman as a, as a guest. And Lenzenman was also a Michigan guy and they, you know, they wrote the streamer book together. So it was kind of cool come full circle again on the river being both of those guys or especially Lenzenman being the, an, an Asable guy and Kelly, you know, guiding on the Asable. I got to, you know, put both of those guys in the movie and got to spend some time with them. So there's been kind of a, you know, some cool, you know, just, you know, relative to the fly fishing world, the small fly fishing world, those little moments where these people that you, you grew up kind of watching or that kind of helped you, you know, in, in your infant stage of fly fishing and get you through that, um, to end up, you know, years later being able to work with these people and fish with them and fish with them. Exactly. That is the powerful thing for me too on this show. You know, I think of like, we've done so many, you know, we're over like 300 episodes and just churning out content. And we had Gene on, uh, Gene Herring, who produced the fly, uh, the, the TV, Fly Fish TV uh, in episode 23. So like many years ago and, um, and Joe Humphrey was, was on in 73 and that was like super powerful because obviously he's this bigger than life yeah. guy. 
Um, and those conversations are amazing. I, you know, Redford, you mentioned Robert again. I want to go back to that because he's been, he, you know, he influenced a lot, me and a lot of people. But what are, if you look at him as an actor, you mentioned actor and director. What are, what would be one movie as an actor, one movie as a director that you'd highlight? Well, what he did with the River Runs Through, because I believe he directed that. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you go back and, you know, the, the whole Redford Newman era. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Know, the, the stuff. Butch Cassidy. Yeah, the, the stuff that they did together. Um, yeah. I, I just think that, you know, he's one of the last, you know, those Hollywood heroes. Yeah. You know, it, it means back in that era, you know, Redford and Newman, you know, that that's just a different time. And, and I don't know. And I don't think we'll ever see that again. Why is that? And you're kind of in that space. I'm curious to get your uh, opinion there because is it just because we've just changed to this? Everything's everybody's got a camera sort of thing. Or why is that that an old an era? Of this because it was an amazing era. You know, even like Clint Eastwood, right? The spaghetti westerns. Yeah, I, I think I think just a lot of it has to do with it. There's just so many options now. You know, the I mean, I think the film industry as a whole. I mean, I mean, put it this way: if I ask you right now. Could you name me a couple movies that are in the theater right now? Could you? No, I mean, I would. That's the thing. You don't even go to the theater, and then I don't even really watch movies like we used to. Right? Exactly. Be, that would be a big production. Because I, I think it's it's so fractionalized now, and 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 then you throw in you know social media, and and now there's these these so called you know social media celebs or influencers who I have no idea yeah. who they are because I'm just not dialed into that. So there's so many, and, and there's a generation of kids who aren't growing up going to the movies. So they may not even know who Paul Newman is or Robert. No. But back in our day, you know, the, the only place to go see a film was, was a theater or a drive-in if you really want to go back. You know, because they, they weren't on television as much. I mean, there was some, obviously, movies on television. But if you wanted to see the latest movie, there was no video stores. There's no stream. You had to go to the theater. Yeah. So it was kind of drilled down a little more. So I think they were more, you know, Hollywood celebrities or movie stars were put on a pedestal much more than they are now. I don't know if there are any. I mean, I guess there still are, but not like back then, you know, the big movie stars. So it's all changed. I mean, look, you know, look what Netflix is doing, you know, and, and look at how many how many actors who I think I think back in the day, even though they may not have admitted, it, there was a difference between you were either a feature actor or you were an episodic actor, meaning you were either right. in a movie theater or you were on TV. Yep. And I think the movie yep. theater people kind of shit on the TV people a little bit. Yeah. You know, if you were any yeah, good, you wouldn't be doing episodics; you'd be doing features. Yeah. And that was always the big thing. I remember when David Caruso left. Uh, what was the big? show that he was on caruso what was oh the uh the the lawyer was it a lawyer no i remember the name it might have been oh no i think that was timothy bussey who was in lawyer one but he yeah but caruso's caruso was in one of those investigative shows but i remember he left. yeah the investigative he, show yeah exactly he was going to be a feature guy and he and and he left to just do feature films and it didn't really work out for him i mean it did, did okay but he he didn't become that big feature film leading dude and i think he ended up back in tv where now you know people are I, i'd imagine just about anyone's clamoring to get on a netflix show right you know so I, I don't i don't think there's there's that delineation anymore of i'm a hollywood i'm a feature person and i'm a tv and this person's a tv person right i think now they're just taking it where they can get it and and since the majority of people are probably watching you know, stuff on Netflix and just, just the amount of content now that's being created between all these pay services, you know, between Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, you know, so I think it's a, it's an interesting time. It's unlimited. To, yeah. To be in this business because there's always shows being done. I mean, I live in Chicago here. I can't walk out. I mean, I guarantee you if I was to probably walk out the door of where I work and walk within six blocks, I'm going to stumble upon a, a movie space location. And I don't mean, I'm, I'm just using movie as a generic term. I'm, I'm going to stumble upon a location of an episodic being shot, or it could be a feature. Oh, right, right. Some, some video, some, something going on. Yeah. There's some show being shot. I'll guarantee you right now, probably within six blocks of where I'm sitting. Oh, wow. They're everywhere in, in Chicago. 
because the the amount of production that's going on is 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 crazy. Oh man, that's nuts. So so that must not be good for traffic. Is this how's Chicago traffic these days? Traffic's bad enough as it is, but when they start really closing down stuff, um, and they're I mean they're always shooting within two or three blocks of where I live. Yesterday when I came home, they had just wrapped up shooting because there was the cranes and the dollies and stuff, and they were just you know all the semis parked along the road and they were packing stuff up, and you can't keep track. I mean, if you look at like you know, just from the television shows, how many different Chicago, Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, Chicago this, Chicago that, and you know, they're all. Oh right, yeah, yeah. What is Chicago? What is Chicago from your perspective? Uh, and maybe thinking of somebody you know who hasn't been there. Why is Chicago so amazing? What what makes it kind of this? You know, what I mean, you, you, it, all this. Everybody wants to go there and hear about it. What what is it? I think all things being equal, it's a very manageable city. I mean, I know Chicago has taken a beating lately for the crime and all that stuff. I, I've never, I've never not felt safe here. Yeah. You know, goofy and I live right downtown and I've lived in downtown for over 20 years. Yeah. I'm walking around. I generally will ride my bike to work every day. I mean, yeah, there's crap that goes on. Right. You know, real close to home. But. Isn't that crazy? You know what that is? I, I feel the same way kind of, you know, out here is that. It's almost like, again, back to the media, the media is showing you the yeah. top five murders yes. on the news. So you think that that's going on. And like when you don't watch media, when you don't watch the news, which I actually, to be honest, don't watch too much of the news. Um, I don't feel that as well either. I, I go all around the city and I never feel in danger. Yeah, I'm, I feel very comfortable here. I mean, again, not saying something couldn't happen, um, but, it's, sure. you know, it's, it's a big city. It's a very manageable city. It's fairly easy to get around. It's not like. You know, I spent a lot of time when I used to live in Boston. I spent a lot of time in New York City. Now, New York City is kind of a big, fast, intimidating city. Chicago is a big city, but doesn't have anywhere near intimidation factor. And I don't mean intimidation like people. It's just New York. No. In terms, of, it's just a big, fast paced, a ton of yeah. people crammed into a very small space. Chicago isn't like that. You can find everything you want to do here. The summers here when it's nice are amazing. The street fairs. You know, it being right on the lakefront makes it very cool. It's like you're looking at an ocean every day. Oh, and nice. as I started yep. messing with uh, last year, I started fishing the lakefront a little bit more. And and shooting summer haze kind of opened my eyes to that. And there's some amazing possibilities that you can catch. You know, I caught a, a last year within my the first time I ever fished the lakefront, within the first half hour, I caught a 10-pound brown. Jeez. You know, right off the a five minute bike ride from my house. Nice. And, and then, you know, I, I, I don't say I have it dialed in in any way, shape or form, but I found some places I could catch big, huge bass. Um, there's guys yeah. catching lake trout, guys catching coho. Uh, there's big pike that will roam in the harbors and up along the, the shoreline. So that's really piqued my interest. And it's, it's great. Cause I live just off. I live right near uh, soldier field. So I live just off. Oh, cool. Um, so, you know, I can be on the lakefront. I can walk to the lakefront in 10 minutes and ride there in, in less than five. So it's a good spot just to run out and grab a rod. I mean, obviously you, you need to really get out early in the morning before it gets too crowded because I don't, I don't need to, you know, put a hook in the back of someone's head. Um, no, but there's opportunities, <laughs> you know, to fish yeah. the lakefront. And, and, and as I've gotten more into it, I've just suddenly open, you know, to open my eyes to just how many people do fish it that I didn't really notice before. You know, I just didn't really know. And are, by fishing it, are you saying uh, both uh, conventional and fly fishing? Yeah, I'm fly fishing, but mostly people are, you know, conventional gear. And they're doing all kinds of weird things out there, long line and stuff for cohos, all these oh, yeah. contraptions of how they're, how they're doing something. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I love it. So that's just a whole nother uh, world that's been opened up to me. Yeah. I think that's the cool thing with where we're going with the fly fishing space. I think that it's just going to continue to, you know, the trout obviously still that pushes everything. Yeah. But as more people realize, there's so many other species out there that are actually fun to catch, you know, and yeah. you mentioned some of them. And that's what got me. I mean, when I got into the whole bass thing, it completely flipped the script for me. Now I don't really trout fish that much anymore. Oh, no kidding. So you actually don't even go up to Wisconsin because you've got stuff yeah. near, nearby, right? That's the idea. I'll maybe do a driftless trip once or twice a year, but if I'm going up to Wisconsin, I'm generally going up into musky country. Into musky country, and I'm right? Looking for bass, pike, and musky. And I do the same thing in Michigan now, where I'm yeah. into throwing the boat 
in lakes and rivers that I can get into. And it's, it's all bass. I don't care. Large mouth, small mouth, uh, pike, unfortunately where I, 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 uh, the summer place that I have up in Northeast Michigan or where I grew up, there's not a lot of musky opportunities. There are some, and I've been digging hard the last couple seasons and come up empty going to some of these places that I've heard about. Yeah. Eventually I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, but there just isn't a good musky opportunities up there more. I think there's more on the, on the Western side of the state, but I think just Michigan in general side of, uh, Oh, good Lord. Lake St. Clair, you know, the, the, oh, yeah. the musky, yeah. thing, you know, is kind of hit or miss in Michigan, which is kind of a bummer and also kind of strange. Yeah. And I asked some DNR people about that and didn't really get a good answer as to like why, if you direct, if you drew a, a direct line from like my hometown across Lake Michigan into Wisconsin, it's all musky, you know, divided by a lake and one state over no musky. Hmm. So that is interesting. Why is that? Never really got a good answer out of that, but there you go. Anyways, we'll try to dig up that answer for you. (laughs) Point being is just that once I expanded my horizons, um, the trout thing, and I will always be a trout weenie, but it, it just, Right now, that's just down a few rungs on the ladder. I think my trout fishing now is I will trout fish, but I only want to catch them the way I want to catch them. I don't want to have to yeah. be forced to stream. I don't want to streamer fish trout. I really don't want to nymph trout. And I know it sounds very snobby. I, I just, when the hatch yep. just come, then I want to fish trout. Exactly. But beyond yeah, that, that's, I don't that's have it. to in a river to streamer fish trout if i'm going to streamer fish i'd rather be for bass pike or musky that's perfect that's perfect well we're going to take it out robert here i i know you've got a little um uh, background i'm not sure if it's a background in music but an interest at least mm-hmm. in music um give us uh give us your you know take us back if you want to say some music preferences uh, do you have if you had to throw out one group or band or something either from your history or currently to give us a flavor of what your music looks like who would that be my music runs the gamut. It really does. Um, yeah. And what is your connection? What is your connection on the music thing? Do you actually have, um, I, I, I know I read something about you have a, you know, a, a real a love for music. Yes. I think my greatest, probably my greatest love in life would be music. I mean, if, you know, if someone said you, you have to choose between say, you know, fly fishing or music. I would probably end up selling the fly rods. There you go. You know, just because everything I do, I always have music. If I'm in the office, I got music on the way to, you know, music. I always have to have, as soon as I walk in the house, music gets turned on. Yeah. Do you listen like on a Spotify type thing or is this stuff you're, how are you listening? I'm the old weird dude who still buys CDs. Oh yeah. CDs. So you got CDs. Awesome. I had a vinyl collection since I kid. I never stopped. I have thousands of records and I, and I play records every single night. And just off the kitchen, you know, off our kitchen, you know, I have kind of like my little, my pseudo manish cave where I have all my records in a yeah. turntable. So every night I pull out, it just, I randomly, I just reach and I don't look, I just pull a record. Oh, wow. And whatever it is, I play it. What did you play last night? Uh, last night was The Alarm. The Alarm. Is that a group? It's a band called The Alarm. Yeah. They were, they were kind of like in that, that U2 80s ish. Oh, 80s, which I always joke about it saying the 80s was like the worst decade of, of music. But is that is that true? No, not in my book. Yeah. See, that's what I think. I think it's this you you remember some of those really crazy bands, but there was some good music in the 80s. It was great music. I mean, I I went through that whole back in my day or our day. They, they you know, they didn't call it alternative. They called it new new wave. Oh, yeah. The alarm was part of that. You know, the alarm, U2, REM, New Order. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. they're great. They were kind of in in, yeah. in in that world. But if if I was to go back and say, you know, from my foundation of what grabbed me and what still will always grab me, my my favorite band. Yeah, you got to pick one. I would probably have to say Zeppelin. Yeah, I love but that. Pink Floyd would come in right there, and and so would Rush. I know I'm one of those Rush. This is so cool. I'm not on the, I mean, I know obviously Rush, I'm not, I'm a Zeppelin, you know, uh, kind of, I had that period right in college, high school, whatever, but, um, 
my I quit. Li- you know, I did, just didn't listen to music. I, I'm a podcaster, obviously. But my kids, who are like nine and seven, I've been throwing in some old Zeppelin CDs in the, in, you know what I mean, in the car, and they're loving it. And that's what's amazing about music because you can pull out something from the '70s and just throw it in there. And Zeppelin's just got. And maybe that's what all these bands, they have this timeless sort of thing, right? It doesn't yeah. be pulled out in 50 years, they'll be good. And and that's and it, that's the unfortunate thing with the music industry has just changed so much that, that, you know, bands don't get nurtured the way they used to. You know, you, you get your, you know, we're going to do everything and we're going to put everything that we have from a label perspective behind you and you're going to get your one record and then we're going to probably move on from you, especially if your second record stalls. But, you know, back in the day, you'd get a record deal and you'd get kind of nurtured and you could hit or hit. Or oh, yeah. And they and they wouldn't bail on. you. So, I mean, today's music, you know, will, will some of those artists ever put out five records? I don't know. Do, do people even do yeah. a whole record? I don't know. I know. You know, the, I know the days of like, like put it this way. When I was going through the record collection a while ago and I was pulling out records, I pulled out. Uh, got into the P's for police and I you know, like a ghost in the machine or Zenyatta. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, these records are going to be so awesome. And I put them on and they are, they're incredible. But the problem with them was, is every song on, or most every song on, on ghost or Zenyatta is a hit song. But then I didn't enjoy it because I, I hear those songs on the radio all the time, you know? So it's like, I wanted to hear deep, but then, but then it also got me thinking, you know, how often does that happen anymore? Where, where a band will put out a record and they'll have like six huge songs off that record. But if you go back to Zeppelin or you go back in the, in the you know, some yeah, it's all. Early, early Doobie Brothers, because I, I went and saw the Doobies not yep. long ago only because they had Michael McDonald. One, and I'd never seen the, the Doobies with, with Michael McDonald. And that was kind of my personal choice of, in the Doobies career. That version with Michael McDonald was probably my favorite. So anyways, I went back and listened to some of, you know, Tulu Street or The Captain and Me. And again, all the old hits, like every other song was like a big hit for them. And I'm like, that just doesn't happen anymore. So that, that, this, it's kind of like the old Hollywood days, that, that era is gone. And I'm so glad I went through it. I mean, you probably remember the days. I remember the days when record stores sold concert tickets and you'd camp oh, up, wow. you could stand in line to buy a concert ticket and there was no scalpers, there's no corporate corporations, you know, the corporate world hadn't gotten involved and you had a reasonably good shot at getting a, a second or third or first row seat. Wow. And the kids these days have no idea what that, what that era was like, you know, yeah. and it's a shame. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like everything else, it, it, it changes. And then we're also getting to the point where, you know, all my, you know, heroes or music, you know, that I really dug, you know, we're losing them. Yeah, that's, you know, that's going to be tough to take, you know, when, when yeah. Eddie yeah, I know. are going and, you know, we're just getting at that age and the Charlie Watts, you know, and that's, you know, just some of the recent ones. You just think, oh, my God, I know. And same thing with fly fishing, you know, like you mentioned, Joe Humphreys and people like that. I mean, we yeah, the greats. Right. I mean, that's the the, the, the crazy thing about life is that it, it all comes to an end for for yeah. everybody eventually. Yeah. And, uh, and who are the next ones? Yeah. Or is, or is that or is that are those days gone? Yeah. You know. So let's leave it off on a positive one here, Robert, on, you know, the light. Like, when you think of this, like what, you know, if you look out at what you have coming, I mean, what gets you excited about kind of just life and living and, and making the most of your, you know, your days left on this planet? For me, I just look forward to uh, getting out of this cold that we're in right now. And oh, is it pretty cold out in the yeah. in there right now? We're, we're still in the in the oh, well, today is nice. But, you know, I think after today, we're back in the 40s again. So I'm, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm right now visions of July and August evenings in the boat on a lake, uh, top water, bass. That's, that's yep. kind of where my, where my headspace is at right now. Warm. And it's kind of just when it warms up and, you know, cause I just, I yeah. don't really steal head fish that much anymore. I've gotten yeah. to the point that I... I want to be somewhat comfortable when I fish, you know, I don't want to catch fish that bad anymore. Well, I was going to say that earlier. There are places, although the steelhead runs on the West have gone down a little bit, but you could fish in uh, 80, 90 degree weather for summer steelhead. Right. And that's a different thing. You're out there in your shorts, but, yes. um, so for you, it still is. Yeah. I mean, it is literally fishing is the thing that when you think about the next 10 plus years, that's really what 
brings you to your kind of your, you know, that happy place. Yeah. Because it's, it's not, it's not, you know, the fishing obviously is one place, but one part of it, but it's, it's, it's where you do it. You know, the saying is, you know, trout don't live in, in, in ugly places, you know, and that, kind of, yeah. you know, same thing can be said from as far as I'm concerned about a lot of fish species. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I was just down bone fishing, uh, not too long ago mm. and I tell you what, you know, standing in the flats looking around that ain't bad either you know so all the different places it takes you you know or it's you you could think of worse places to spend three four or five days so to me going up to the summer place um there's no place i'd rather be because there's so many options and you can do something different and fish a different way for a different species in a different kind of body of water every day and never get yeah so that's, that's, kind of, that's amazing. That's where, you know, if, if I could just, you know, check out of this world and just go up there and, and of course I say that now and, and, and then when I can fish every day, give me about a month of it and I'm bored of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's, that's right. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I think it was the perfect, I'm going to, I've got, we've mentioned Zeppelin, so I've got to put, uh, and I'm thinking good times, bad times. And I love yep. You know, that's just one song and I'm going, I wish I could figure out the right stuff, right? Because I would love to end this episode with a long, just play that song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I know we can't do that because, but I will put a, I will put a YouTube video in the show notes. So I'm going to go and people can go listen to that song right now because, uh, you know, I love that one. And, um, and, uh, yeah, Robert, well, I think, I think we're good here. We, uh, this has been good getting to know you here a little bit more. And uh, anything you want to leave us with before we head out here, maybe in the next kind of uh, looking ahead um, with you, or you're just going to keep doing the same good stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there, there might be a, you know, a, a kind of revamping of something I did in the past is about the only thing. And, and it may come to fruition. It may not. Um, I'm going to start sending out some feelers here probably shortly just to see who may be interested in, in, in joining me on that one. Um, mm-hmm. but other than that, I'm, you know, I am kind of ramping things, you know, down a little because I, I, I've been like, like I said earlier, you know, 10 to 12 years of pretty much nonstop going from one to the next. Um, and, and I, and I would just like to, you know, cause I get that question a lot. You, uh, is it tough for you to sit yep. and watch people fish all day? Yes and no. I mean, and it certainly cuts it my own fishing time because I do, you know, really like to fish. And it's, it's also interesting that a lot of people, you know, I've had multiple people been in multiple projects, right? And they've never seen me fish. They don't know if I can fish or not. Right. They, they've always seen me with a camera in my hand, and, but have never seen me with a fly rod in my hand. So that's also kind of an, an, an interesting dynamic as well. So I, I love to fish and, it, and, it, and I get torn because like if I do this thing I'm thinking of, it, it's going to, you know, it's going to kind of screw my fishing up a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. anyways, yeah. So that's, but you love it. You know, you love it. I do love it. it's it's a it's a weird it's a weird balance. I, I I almost like to shoot these things as much as I like to fish. Yep, <laughs> it, it's a it's a tough place to be. Well, it's a good place to be because you found your passion. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a and, and people kind of warn me. You know, w- way back in the day when like these things were just really starting, like the film tour was just starting to get going and stuff. And people that knew me that I was getting into fly fishing also knew I worked in in, in the business were like, "God, you should do some of these things." And I and, and I was adamant, no, I, I don't want to. Yeah. You know, whatever the saying is, don't turn your your hobby or your passion yep. into your job. And 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 here right. I kind of did that, but it's it's worked out. You know. It's, it's worked out. It, it's kind of worked out. So, you know, you're not, you're not getting what you're doing. And I, and, I, and I can't quit my job, but I wouldn't want to nope. either. I, I like doing these just no. enough because if I had to do this, if I had to make fly fishing or fishing content full time, I, I, I don't think I could do it because I get, I get yeah. bored just enough of, you know, because, you know, like when I look through, and not to keep belaboring this, but like when I look through oh, yeah. a viewfinder, you know, how many times have I, have I shot the same shot? Because you, if you're in a camera, uh, behind a camera in a boat, you only have so many options. And I can't tell you how many close-ups of a reel I've shot or somebody straight right. line, you know, or the tip of the rod in yeah. the water or whatever, or the or cast or whatever. I, thousands of times I've, I've got that exact same shot. The same shot, but at the same time, you're, you're telling stories essentially, yeah. right? So you're always getting a new story. And so it's a little different, but, you know, I can't help but when I sit there, you know, especially like on a muskie shoot, because you get a lot of time to do nothing, you know, looking, you yep. find your thing, God, how many times have I shot this shot or this shot? Right. Shot? So, so, oh, so you do a lot of 
self-assessment in the back of a boat. Yeah. Thinking, what, am, what are you doing? Why are you doing this again? That's right. But you do it because because I do. You know, when I when I'm not doing, I start thinking about, boy, it'd be nice to kind of do another one. I know. We'll see. That's it. Awesome, Robert. We'll send everybody to uh, thirdyearflyfisher.com if they have questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, spending some time today. This has been amazing. And uh, we'll definitely look forward to keeping in touch with you as we uh, move forward. Absolutely. Dave, appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. So there you go. Another one in the books. If you want to check out the show notes and everything else we talked about, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 323. 323 is where you can get the goods. Before we head out of here, just want to give a good shout out to to you. Yeah, that's right. I'm shouting out to you. If you're still listening to this episode, I want to say and give you a big thank you. Uh, We are finishing this up. I'm going to wrap it up really quickly here. But just wanted to let you know you can reach out to me anytime. Dave at wetflyswing.com. If you have a show topic or idea or just want to connect with me, I would love to hear that you actually checked out this show social media wet fly swing and you can let me know and we can follow up there and uh, and keep this uh keep this train rolling all right i wish i could throw in a johnny cash uh a johnny cash song here to wrap it up but uh we're gonna have to put that video in the show notes so if you want to hear a little johnny cash uh, we're gonna throw in um uh, what is that song i hear the train is coming uh it's rolling down the bin and i ain't seen the sunshine since i don't know when i'm stuck in Folsom prison and time keeps dragging on. There you go. I hope you're not stuck in Filson Prison, but if you are and you're listening to the show, I also want to give you a big uh, virtual fist bump. I appreciate you. I appreciate the support, and I hope that you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Talk to you and see you on the water or online soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.